Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. How is everyone doing? It's December and you know what I realized? I was just thinking about this a little bit earlier that December I started my YouTube channel so it's almost been a year since I've been posting YouTube videos and I think that's pretty exciting. I didn't even think it would be a year. I was gonna even do this. I just did this because I got injured and I was like, oh, I'm bored. And now I do this all the time. And I wanna thank each and every one of you guys who come out to my videos and watch them every week or whenever I post them. It just means the world to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so yeah, what's new? I kinda got festive, put balls in a jaw. And it's Christmas, it's almost Christmas. It's super exciting. I'm really, really excited for Christmas. I'm just excited to have some time off, really. Out of everything I'm not excited for anything else but just to have a little bit of vacation my grandma is coming down which is super exciting too um, and yeah I'm just I'm ready to relax eat good food and just be around people I care about I think the last two years for most of us have been pretty crappy and I just want to veg out really with some good people that I know so I'm get excited and ready to go so what do you guys do for Christmas let me know down below the other thing I really want to thank each and every one of you guys for is I notice I've been getting a lot of subscribers lately I don't know how I've been getting so many subscribers I don't know how I just like jumped from like 120 to now being at 140 and to me that's extreme I'm just like really want to thank each and every one of you guys especially because I've been so inconsistent lately Inconsistent is the word I was looking for. Inconsistent. <laughs> Inconsistent. And I just want to thank each and every one of you guys who have subscribed lately. It's just been great and amazing. Also, if you guys are wondering, I'm wearing a new pair of earrings from Moss and Sparrow. Um, I will link them down below again like I usually do if you want to check them out. I'll also link the um, creator's Instagram down below so you guys can check them out. So today we're going to do a little bit of a different story. This isn't a murder. This isn't a, you know, kind of serial killer type of vibe. This is a person who considered themselves as a robber and who went down in history as one of the most notorious criminals that have ever came to Canada when it comes to being a, just robbing people. And one of the funny things is a lot of people admired him. He was like a kind of mafia lord type of dude and everyone loved him. So we're going to get into the story about Leishman who stole so much stuff. So like always, I'm going to try to tell you guys the products I'm using on my face while I'm in the video. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It is what it is. So again, I'm going in with the Putty Bronzer, Putty Bronzer, the Putty Primer from e.l.f. I like to use the Putty Primer just in my T-section kind of thing. Just so, you know, it really fills in my pores and stuff like that. My nose has tons of pores and then I like to use the rest of the primer. The other primer is for around my face. And the other primer I will be using is the Honey Do Me Up <laughs> from NYX. It's a funny name. This one, like I say in all my videos, everyone says it is the dupe for milk. I don't think that is accurate anymore. I heard Elf Mint one is the dupe now for the milk one. So we'll just see about that. All right. So in the 1950s to the 60s, Ken Leishman stole planes, he robbed banks, he staged prison breaks, he was considered one of the most notorious people in Can Canada history, Can Canada history, Canadian history, to ever, like, do what he did. Like, he was the best of the best, and everyone knew him. Born in Manitoba, Ken had a very rough childhood, Maybelline, had a very rough childhood, his parents divorced when he was a child and he spent time in a in various foster homes so you know bouncing back and forth and in the foster homes he was abused uh thrown in good measures so he was abused thrown around he the people who were watching him thought that they were doing good but really at a long run they were hoarding him and I find a lot of these criminals who don't know much, like his life was probably, you know, made around stealing and surviving, just just to steal to eat when he was hungry, stuff like that. And I find a lot of criminals usually start that way. Their life as a child isn't good because of how, what they grew up with and that's all they kind of know. Um, he later ended up in his grandparents' farm 
but was twice kicked in the head by a horse. So brain damage is also a big like key when it comes to criminals. So he's kicked in the head twice, um, leading to who knows what kind of exactly long-term damage and character alterations the brain damage could have possibly caused him. Later, he tried his hand at a number of jobs, but bad luck followed him. And in addition, in addition to these things, like a broken ankle and busted appendix, he suffered another concussion while walking on the railroad. Railroad, oh my God, railroad. Um, and was in a coma for three days, all hit all this while he was still a teenager. So still very young, still having, you know, his brain was still developing at the time. And all this bad stuff was happening to him. So not the best outcome for the poor guy. But, you know, that's how criminals are. So later he married, but his life of crime also began. So when he was 18, he married his wife. And that's usually when, not usually, that is when his um, crime and his path started to begin. He sold furniture for his new apartment. Uh, he was arrested. He spent part of his honeymoon in jail. So he was all over the place. And this is when he finally got the first taste of being a criminal and how he wanted to really, you know, this was his dream. This wasn't his dream, but he's like, you know what? I'm good at this, so let's just keep it going. Later, he seemed to get his life together, and after taking a couple of flying lessons, he bought a plane, and although he never actually bothered with the formalities of getting his pilot license, he began flying farm machinery repairmen to and from places. Later, he became a salesman for culinary cookware so this guy was um you know doing it all he got he didn't actually get his uh plane license but he's like this is good enough right i know how to fly so i'm just going to do it anyways so this guy was jumping from job to job to job and now he at this age he has a wife he has a kid and he bought a house in winnipeg and he really needed to support them instead of just jumping from job to job to job in addition he was a snappy dresser. Everyone always commented on his clothes. He was always wearing a suit. It was too much for him. Um, he kind of like people kind of got to know him as a snappy dresser, always wearing the newest of the new. And with the income that he had, it never really made sense about, you know, why he dressed that nice and where he got the money to support all this. So in November of 1957, when he was 26 years old, the cookware company where he was a salesman closed and he would soon be in deep financial trouble. So usually the first things that happen when people go in deep financial trouble is they go to crime because it's quick and easy money, right? It's not the typical, you know, nine to five, I have to wait for my paycheck and the government's taking it all. Whatever you make in the life of crime, you get to keep because no one's taxing that, right? You just get to, it sounds great. Like there's been lots of times in my life where I fantasize about being a criminal, but I have anxiety over the littlest things. So that will never happen. I'm never gonna be able to rob something or do anything because I would be so paranoid about it. Like they're gonna catch me and I just couldn't do it. So he was like, damn, I'm in financial trouble. I've, like I said, wife and kid just bought a house in Winnipeg. Like what? What else can go wrong? A month later, uh, Ken began his legacy and he started to think of extremely bold robberies that he could do. He flew the, he flew over 1,500 kilometers from Winnipeg to Toronto, a daring feat in itself in Canada in the Canadian winters, especially a small plane. I already said, if I ever become rich one day, the one thing I'll never do is buy a small plane because you always hear about rich people who own a lot of money. What do they always die in? Small planes. So don't buy a small plane. Like they always die. That billionaire that knew, that knew Trump who also had um, a mine here in Hinton died in a small plane. Kobe Bryant died in a small plane. I'm sure there's probably, there was a singer in Brazil who died in a small plane. Don't buy a small plane if you ever become rich. You hold it here first.
So I think I said a while ago how I wanted to take some of my eyeshadow palettes that I have and I wanted to do one look with just a single eyeshadow palette. And I think I'm going to do that today. I'm going to start with this e.l.f. one. Electric Mood is what it's called. I got it on sale because I'm cheap. And I think I'm going to try to do a look with every color. Not every color, like just use this palette for this look and then my next video I'll use my Fenty palette and like so on and so on if you get my drift. If not, then just stay tuned and keep watching. So after spending the night in the luxury hotel, he entered a bank downtown and um, on the pretext of a business loan. So he went in saying that he needed a business loan, got to see the manager. Behind closed doors, he pulled a gun and forced the manager to write a $10,000 check. So back in the day, this was in the 1950s, $10,000 was a lot. Like anyone can get in, anyone could get out of debt in $10,000 back in the 50s. Nowadays, that's pocket change, right? Like flipping, have you seen how much gas is here on the border? $10,000 is nothing. That's going to get no one out of debt, right? Anyone can get a loan. Anyone can buy whatever they want. But it doesn't mean you're any richer, it just means you got more shit and more debt. That's all that means. So the guy made him write a $10,000 uh, check. Uh, he then questioned the man about his life and family, which might seem odd at first, but Ken was smart. So he was like, you know, I'm going to give this guy a little, little questionnaire before I take all of his money and see if I can get anything else out of him. Heading to uh, the teller with the novice manager beside him, he used the information that he has just been told in the friendly conversation to easily convince the teller that he was a good personal friend of the manager. So he's like, oh, Barbara, uh, the manager's wife, we go back in high school and the three kids, this and this, like, let me tell you about that. We know each other from a while. And the teller's like, cool, what do you need, right? So he kind of got away with that. The teller... Um, gave cash, she, uh, the person cashed the check, they're like, Kate, no problem, with a smile, Ken maintaining his, uh, kind of, his little, like, you know, I know this guy from a, a long time, he kind of kept that going, and had the manager accompany him to the gateway car outside, thanked him and set away, leaving the manager, at, the manager somewhat flustered on the sidewalk, so the manager was just like, what the hell just happened, right, he's like, this was crazy. He drove to the airport and flew back to Winnipeg. The police were, of course, baffled. They're like, what? Who was the guy? Where did he come from? And where did he go? Where did they come from? None of the usual sources had any idea who the guy was. And the style of the crime was entirely new to them. Like, this dude just rolls up, right? He's like, how's it going? I'm going to need you to give me some shit. And then I'll be out of here and just dipped. Like everyone was like, the hell just happened? And then he flew away like some sort of Bruce Wayne type of character, right? No one knew, no one understood. And everyone was just like, this was the craziest shit that they've ever seen. And it worked. So at this point, Ken's rolling in the 10,000 Gs. He's living his best life. He's, you know, thinking that he's Wolf of Wall Street type of guy. And I'm gonna sneeze. Ooh. So he's thinking like he's Wolf of Wall Street. He just made 10 grand. He's just chilling, you know, paid off some debt because he lost his job. His wife's like, yo, where'd you get this money? He's like, don't worry, babe. I'm buying you a mansion. She's like, sick, you know? If I, like, honestly, if my husband came home one day, it was like, I just have a check here or some cash for half a million dollars we're gonna cat i'm not gonna ask how he got the money i don't need to know all i need to know is i'm gonna go shopping we just paid off our debt we're gonna get a new house and that's it i don't even know where you got the money i don't want to be accomplice right take the money and go man i had no clue i just spent it and i will never know and i won't tell anyone you know kind of thing so he's getting bored right ken's getting bored he's like I got the 10 grand, I paid some debt off, and now I feel like I need a little bit more money. So a few months later in March of 1958, he was like getting bored. He tried the same thing, but this time he was caught outside after a telepath uh, pressed the emergency button. And he tripped over uh, a passenger outside. So, you know, 
That one didn't work out. So since all this happened, he was sentenced to 12 years. He was out in three and a half after being what the warden described as a model prisoner. So he was sentenced to 12. He got three, not even a half. No one seems to care here in Canada. They said this guy's probably chill. Let him out. He seems like a good guy. Not a big deal, right? Wrong. Because he's like, he caught me once. He ain't going to catch me again, right? One of his conditions was that he couldn't leave the province of Manitoba. For the next few years, things was quiet. As far as people know, it was quiet. But on March 11th, 1966, he was picked up by police in Vancouver on parole violations for having left Manitoba and sent back to serve the rest of his sentence in prison in that province. So one of the things that they do do here in Canada is once you are, like, if you get sent out, or you get out of jail and one of your conditions, you usually go on house arrest and that is for however long that they give you. If you do break it, however long left you have on the house arrest, they will make you serve it. it so if you have 10 years left, they'll make you serve those 10 years in jail now. So, but police were already desperately trying to convict him to one of the boldest and biggest robberies in Canadian history, which taken place a little over a week earlier. From his experience of flying out of Winnipeg airport, Ken knew that gold billion from the mines in Red Lake in Northern Ontario were flown in on small planes to the Winnipeg airport in set like semi regular like times. He knew that this happened all the time and he's like, this happens a lot. I need to get in on this, is what he was thinking. He's like, this is crazy. They're making tons of money doing this shit. How do I get in on it, right? And he's like, I have a small plane. I live in Minip Minipeg, Winnipeg, you know? The, they would later be transferred to a larger aircraft on um, Air Canada planes to fly to international mines in Ontario or Ottawa. So they like, okay, he's like, I kind of understand he's been, you know, watching, tracking, looking, you know, trying to, he's like, ah, he's addicted now. He's addicted. He, he's got the taste of the robbery. He's a cr criminal. He knows what he wants and now he wants the gold, right? So Ken worked out a plan. He gathered four accomplishments, including a lawyer, good choice. One of the gang was set up in Red Lake Airport in Ontario. The man was a, was to advise the others when the gold flight was to take off from the little airport there for approximately a three hour flight. Not that long, you know. He's like, it's gonna be a short one. I've got this like kind of weird reflective color, you know. So he's like, yeah, so they're going to be flying. This is going to be easy, easy peasy is what they're thinking. It's only a three hour flight. So on March 1st, 1966, the call came that the gold flight was on its way to Winnipeg. So they're like, time to get crack a lock. Ken began to well know, began to well know himself. He had two others die, uh, disguised with coveralls as Air Canada flight employees with fake Air Canada waybills. Ken had snatched from his unattached counter and Air Canada truck had been stolen. The two men drove the truck to the airplane hangar. So he had it made. So they explained to the crew that was on the terminal, they're like, hey, um, we're here to change the flight. We're ready to go instead. Like, this is the truck we're taking. Sorry. And they're like, okay, cool. When Air Canada truck, sorry, with the Air Canada truck uniforms and apparently proper way belts, the box of bars were loaded onto the truck, which drove away about $385,000 worth of gold, something in the neighborhood of $3 million today, was the value that they stole. A bold, brilliant, well-executed plan, again with no one hurt. They are already made headlines across Canada and indeed the world. They're like, this is one of the craziest heists. And like, it sounded so easy. This guy literally walked in, 
took a couple like name tags and a truck and was like, let's go become millionaires. And it bloody walked, which was even crazier. And everyone was like, like we're going to take the gold. And they're like, you know what? We get paid minimum wage. We don't care. You can take it anywhere, right? Like, watch me give a shit. I'm not going to risk my life for this gold that I make nothing for. Like, that's what insurance is for. Hopefully they have it. Because we don't care. So, the plan was perfectly executed, but for a very simple flaw is what changed it. Police soon discovered the abandoned Air Canada truck and found fingerprints. So, rule number one, boys, wipe it down. Like, or wear gloves. Like... This is supposed to be the biggest heist and you can't even figure that one out? Like, get out of here. Um, suspecting the well thought out plan had been the work of a mastermind, they suspected Ken and began investigating all his contacts. They thought of him right off the jump because he's got a small plane, one. He's done these crazy things before. Well, he did it like twice and it, it worked. So he's smart about it. And, you know, he's connected. He's got these other lawyer friends and shit like that. And like, this guy could have done it i'm just gonna put my eyeliner on um after after right now off camera because i suck at it eyeliner is on except for that one spot it seems to be bugging me give it and then could you imagine that just screwed the whole look up <laughs> okay so it didn't take long before they found the trail and eventually recovered the gold buried in the backyard and connected ken to the whole thing They're like this is the guy who did it and they were right they're like this was easy by the time by this time though ken had already something of a folk hero so you know people were already talking about him as the everyday working man who carried out these bold robberies without hurting anyone no one got hurt no one got shot no one got killed people like this guy is a genius let him be they're like let this guy keep robbing you guys he ain't hurt anyone, right? So everyone really enjoyed him um, just because he didn't hurt anyone. And you see a lot of robberies where they go bad and then they get, you know, somebody gets knocked out. So every, his even, like, he had a great smile, friendly demeanor, and snappy dressing didn't hurt his image either. And on March 20th, he was charged with conspiracy of robbery. I never liked the word conspiracy of robbery because it's like, bitch, he did it. So I'm going to get my lashes ready and I will, you know, I always mess this up. My lashes take me forever to do and I don't know why because I've been doing this for a year. You think I would have it down pat by now, but I don't. So he's, he gets arrested. He gets charged with ma mail. He gets charged with conspiracy to uh, rob even though, oh my God, I do this every time where I, Squeeze like just a gallon of this out onto my lashes. Do I know why I keep doing this? No. Has has it been a year and I still do the same thing? Yes. So he's charged, he's in jail, he's hanging out. And you think, you know what? That's the end of this guy. He had a good run. He robbed a couple people, jumped on his private plane and dipped off. You think, mm, that's enough of his bold adventures. No. So though as he later organized a break out of prison, he spit on roadblocks and massive man huts. He was crazy. Like Ken, with three others, stole a plane and flew to Gary, uh, Indiana in the US. So he got out, broke out, and was like, I'm a pilot, I'm gonna steal a plane. Which is like pretty brilliant in my mind. Because, you know, anyone can drive and once you start driving around, it's pretty easy to get caught. A lot of people do it and then they get caught. So he's like, I'm taking a plane. So he took the plane, he went to Indiana in the US. This was reinforcement for his reputation as a flying bandit. People started calling him the flying bandit, do this. Uh, recognized from the newspapers by a local bomb man, police surrounded them and after a brief shootout and standoff, they were returned to Manitoba, where Ken, still smiling, noticed the crowd which had come to the airport to see him and cheer him as he was some kind of modern Robin Robin Hood. People love this dude. They said, this is the guy. Like, his story is still not over. And as a lone prisoner in an old street jail in Winnipeg, he managed to open a supposedly foolproof lock gate, 
overpowered three gods and climbed over friends to freedom. It was very short lived because he was picked up on the phone booth a few hours later and spent the next several years in jail and isolation. He was released in 1974. He moved to Red Lake in 1977 where as a pilot on a local business he was well liked and became a chairman of a local chamber and began using his flying skills in the air as an ambulance. So you know he kind of you know, became a better guy. So I'm just gonna put my lashes on and I'll be right back. Him becoming um, an ambulance pilot is when people kind of thought, oh, this guy's done, you know, he's being tracked, people notice him, people see him, he's well liked. So everyone was like, yo, he's good to go. But then in 1976, 79, sorry, as the pilot of a medevac mission, his plane disappeared over northern uh, Ontario. The wreckage was spotted the following year and bodies of the um, people on the plane and the medical assistants were found, but all the bodies were found except for one and that was Kent's. So this started making people talk again and they people speculated that he escaped again. But more of an investigation and inquiry happening and then that later speculated to animals um, somehow wolves perhaps had taken the body away and eaten it as it then he was declared officially dead in December 16 of 1980. The gentleman's thief story lives on however and in 2005 a television document documentary written by Bob Lawyer and directed by Norman Bailey entitled Ken Leishman the Flying Bandit records his life as a career in a, a, they recorded his life and a career as him being a criminal. So he still lives on and one of the things I do like about I love criminals who get away with shit I think it's only when it doesn't hurt people like this guy so the one thing I really did like about the story was how he never hurt anyone and he just kind of you know he went into a financial slum he all of a sudden was like I'm going to start stealing shit and he did and then no one got hurt he didn't murder anyone he didn't hold anyone for a ransom he didn't take anyone for hostage he might have spooked the manager at the um, the bank, but that was it. You know, like he wasn't like, gun to the head, I'm going to shoot you. He's like, write this check for me, talk to me about your kids and your wife, and I'll be on my way. And I dress nice. So like he was, a, he was an overall chill dude. Never got a divorce, just kind of chilled. He did escape, you know, he did overtake three gods, but they're there for a reason. If one guy can take three of you guys on at once, we got a bigger problem. So I thought this was kind of a different, cooler story. Just about a dude living his life, you know, he became, had a career in being a criminal and didn't hurt anyone. He wasn't like a drug lord or anything like that. He just was a regular dude who wanted money and did it the wrong way, but still did it with flavor. So I really enjoyed this story. I thought this guy was cool. Um, I can't wait to watch the documentary on him and see what's gonna happen. Like, they never actually found his body. They just assume he's dead. He's probably still chilling, you know, living his best life. So yeah, that's the video for today. It was a little bit shorter, a little bit different, but it was still pretty interesting. My look was different. I actually kind of enjoyed it. A little brownie reds with a little bit of some weird brownie gold glitter on it. I think it's pretty cool. I tried to went basic with everything else. Just a little bronzer, a little blush, and a new lip, you know? So yeah, that's the video. And again, thank you guys so much for coming out and spending your Thursdays with me and watching Thriller Thursday. And thank you guys for subscribing. It means the world to me. Again, like and subscribe to this video or hit the little bell down below and you'll get notified for every time I do post a video so you won't miss one. Because you never know what I'm going to post now. I'm all over the place. Again, my earrings are from Moss and Sparrow. I will be um, posting down below. These ones are super cool. If you see close, they got little faces on them. I love them. I love this color. I was wearing a different color before my last video. Well, the same color, but a different style. She does great work. Go check her out. It's amazing. She also does candles and stuff like that. And she will be having an online store here soon, which is going to be great. And I will also be linking that. So again, guys, thank you guys so much for coming out and watching my videos. I hope you guys have a great week, a great rest of your day, evening, morning, whatever it is. Just make sure you guys are having a good day and I'll see you again on next uh, Thursday. So I will see you guys later. Bye.